Okay, uh, AREC 173, week of October 5th to 9th, fourth mini lecture. I'm back with my coffee and ready to go into this. So um, this section is uh, sort of concepts again, we're gonna use uh, especially the concept of ecosystem services, the way of thinking about the benefits that people get from the environment. I'm gonna share my screen again and Okay, this is where we ended off, um, was about this, uh, you know, thinking about the big, the, at the earth system scale, this idea of novel compounds or novel substances, which here we're thinking about things like pesticides. Um, and then, well, what about that, uh, right? And, and how does the way we do agriculture affect that? So now um, I'm going to kind of take you to this um, this I, some some more concepts. Uh, so we talked about so this is kind of back again to this big scale. These kind of nine things. What's driving these? So that's a, these uh, planetary boundaries are a little bit of a combination of kind of amounts of stuff and. Uh, which exists somewhere at some particular place, kind of stocks and flows of stuff that are moving from one place to another. What's driving the flows are these big cycles. So there are three big cycles. There's also gravity drives flows, right? The things are going to, uh, uh, things that we release to the atmosphere might slowly come out of the atmosphere. Things which get into water bodies might run down, uh, run downstream. Lots of things kind of ultimately end up in kind of the ocean depths in the longest scale, right? So that's a that's a driving force. The other things are these things which are driven essentially by solar energy, right? Um, so uh, and we'll, we'll get into this in a, in a sec. So we've got. The water cycle, right? So is this, you know, there's driven by gravity, but also by solar energy, which is the cause of evaporation. We've got plants which grow, which uh, transpirate. Uh, so water moves from the soil or from a water body <clears throat> through plants or, or directly evaporates up in the atmosphere uh, and then it's coming down. So we've got this water cycle uh, and water may percolate through the soil into groundwater and then ultimately into the ocean. Uh, things are sort of connected and then we've got this big cycle, right? So we know about that, just so we learn about that in grade seven science, I assume. Um, we've got two other uh, big cycles. We've got the carbon cycle. Uh, so this is, we say biogeochemical. So there's a biological part of that because um, Soil, the, the it's like things which live in the soil, whether they be plants or microorganisms or earthworms or things like that, are biological. They, when they, uh, uh, when they, they interact with their in their environment, their chemical processes, and that's determined sort of by a geological kind of context, sort of the soil context or geological materials which are there. So the biogeochemical kind of recognizes all those things working together. Um, the carbon cycle then is how carbon flows from uh, the atmosphere. Uh, then it is um, affected by uh, things like um, carbon may accumulated by, by plants, uh, <clears throat> then may be released back to the atmosphere or it may be uh, kind of make its way into durable things like wood products, um, that, which are kind of stocks, or it, or it may be um, released back to the atmosphere or it may end up in the oceans, right? So we've got this carbon cycle, we've got a water cycle and that those things are related to, to some extent. We've also got a nitrogen cycle. A nitrogen, as you know, is the most plentiful element in our atmosphere. Uh, it, but it has these multiple chemical forms uh, that are of so like methane and nitrous oxide, um, which are created by different biogeochemical processes. Um, and uh, we have um, things which are then released and some of them are quite potent as we saw with NO2 
and, and methane, quite potent greenhouse gases, which then um, move into the into the atmosphere and, and there and are causing global warming uh, from that. We've got, so those are three big, three big cycles, which run many of these other uh, processes that, that deform the planetary boundaries. Um, we've also got these ecosystems. We've talked about that in terms of biodiversity. We've talked about ecosystem biodiversity. So here's a more formal definition uh, as a biological community of interacting organisms, so plant, animal, bacteria, organisms, and the environment in which they interact, and is driven by uh, interactions with the water, uh, carbon, and nitrogen cycles. So let's think about different ways that uh, agriculture could affect, or in other human use, might affect these different cycles. So here we've got the water cycle, um, so we can think about the fact that uh, crops, um, let's see, it's right here. Just gotta move my bar. Um, so we can think about the way that crops grow and the trees grow, transpires water uh, from the soil up into the atmosphere, right? Um, we then, uh, that water that water may be pushed by a lateral flow, which might be a prevailing wind, either out to the ocean or, or back onto the, um, mostly back onto the land base. The water then, it then condenses and falls uh, and then makes its way down uh, through either into the groundwater and ultimately into the ocean or into uh, maybe on the soil surface where it's used by plants itself directly, or it may accumulate into a river or a reservoir and make its way ultimately down all the way downstream. So the type of plants matter, right? For the amount of water that they use, we may have very fast growing trees like eucalyptus trees, which, um, and bam uh, giant bamboo, which grow like crazy, but they use large amounts of water. We may have other water saving crops. Uh, things like millets in India are, are seen as drought tolerant and, and we use small amounts of water. So the type of crop or the type of tree, the type of tree matters, right? Um, how we cultivate. So if we cultivate across a hillside or whether we cultivate down, up and down the hillside affects the channeling of water up and down or whether water has more of a chance to infiltrate or whether it's more likely to run off. So that matters, the way we cultivate matters. Um, what else we want to say about that? Uh, so if we have uh, irrigation facilities, uh, which uh, re rely on kind of reservoirs of water, that, uh, and then how we channel that into the irrigation canals, that matters, or whether we're using groundwater, that, that choice of groundwater or canal water matters. So there's lots and lots of ways because agriculture such a dominant user of water, uh, using, um, um, <clears throat> well, 70% of all the water that we harness is used for agriculture. It, it has all these different effects. So we can think about different ways um, that we can, uh, that agriculture is affecting that. Okay. Let's see what's going on here. Okay. Second thing then is the nitrogen cycle. How is agriculture affecting that? So here's this pretty complex uh, cycle of uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is N2, uh, which is 80% of the atmosphere. Uh, electrical storms uh, create NO3. Uh, we can have a fixation, uh, which um, at uh, nit so nitrogen fixing by plants like the Felgerbia albida, a, a legumous tree um, that fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. And as it does that, it also releases methane. Uh, and also, as I said, ruminant livestock release methane, as does irrigated rice that all release methane. Um, we can think about then what happens when we fertilize, uh, what's not used by the plant, uh, then it kind of may go lower uh, where we got Ammonium, for example, NH4, nitrif nitrification. Um, 
and nitrates may form uh, in the soil and then kind of work their way into groundwater. So you can get nitrate pollution of groundwater or they may be released back into the atmosphere. Um, so we've got this variety of ways then that our agriculture uh, might affect the nitrogen cycle. Um, and this and the Haber-Bosch process is this industrial process using large amounts of energy, um, combining the, uh, the nitrogen from the air with hydrogen from natural gas um, and an iron catalyst, and that's how we produce uh, liquid ammonia, right? So this is drawing from the night. So it's affecting nitrogen cycle. Well, there's lots of nitrogen, but it's a, it's a relatively irreversible process in that the nitrogen we're drawing from the atmosphere to create nitrogen fertilizer isn't left in the atmosphere. So at the longest scale, uh, we're, we're drawing down through this process, we're drawing down our stocks of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And what about the uh, kind of the carbon cycle? So here's a um, thinking about the, both the carbon cycle and to some extent the nitrogen cycle and how agriculture affect both of these. Um, I think we've talked about most of these before. Um, so we've got things like burning. So if we're in many parts of the world, people, the crops they grow produce so much biomass that they don't know what to do with it. And it creates um, like water logging problems like we have in the Red River Valley in Manitoba. Uh, we can't just work it into the soil. We have to, have to burn it. That releases things back to the atmosphere. If you're, if you're using like the uh, fertilizer matters, um, it, as producing crops, and whether that crop is used for human consumption or used for livestock consumption. As I said, uh, rice and livestock both produce, and ruminant livestock both produce methane emissions. Um, and then we've got soil carbon. I think that one thing I will talk about here is uh, soil carbon in particular. Soil carbon is uh, really, really, really cool. Um, if you can uh, bind soil in in bind carbon into the soil, then you have uh, a, a an environment for growing plants, which is much more healthy for the plants to grow. Is a plant is a soil that is high in soil organic carbon. Um, it also can be fixed in relative in relatively unstable um, forms, and therefore be uh, kind of held that carbon and not being back released. Um, so one of the things we see when we think about big scale land degradation processes is to what extent have they lost, has that soil lost the carbon stock? And it could be from kind of inappropriate cultivation methods um, or really, or, or even driven by poverty, the people aren't able to reinvest in uh, the carbon in their soils. They're not able either directly or by say having fertilizer, which produces more organic matter, which then you can rework back in your soils. So uh, the, a big emphasis of kind of healthy long-term soil management is, is how do we maintain quality of, of soil carbon? Um, and that is a, a kind of a major emphasis of sort of the agronomists in the, uh, of, of the world. Okay, so we've you know covered a lot of material in this uh, set of slides. Um, you know, given quite a few definitions, just one more set of definitions that we are, are going to bring in, and that's uh, so we've already talked about ecosystem. I think in a previous slide, a another way to think about so the ecosystems has all these functions which are driven by these cycles, right? Um, and they produce, they do things. They produce some things which are really healthy for the overall environment, right? And for the other, the plant and animal communities. And that's really great. Uh, and healthy ecosystems are important for being, you know, just as part of healthy environment for biodiversity conservation or other things. They're also, we also think about ecosystems producing stuff for us as people. And that's what we're mostly motivated by in most of our decisions about agriculture is, well, if I invest in something, am I gonna get a return on it that I can kind of count on, that, that matters to me? 
So that's uh, a, the group of economists and, and ecologists uh, about 30 years ago came up with this idea of, well, let's, let's look at the world. What happens if we look at the world primarily from the benefits that people get out of it, out of ecosystems? And let's call those things ecosystem services. So ecosystem functions are just things that are done, that ecosystems do. Ecosystem services here, I'm defining narrowly as the benefits that people get from ecosystems. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was a UN-led uh, um, effort that started around year 2000, ended around uh, the year 2005, which did a kind of a global stock taking for the first time of kind of what's the state of that, of us getting stuff as people from our ecosystems. They came up with these four categories of benefits, or you could think of these things that might kind of enter in uh, these first, especially the first three, enter into your utility function. Uh, you might get direct utilitarian benefit. So the first category are provisioning services. So sometimes people call these as ecosystem goods in, a, in Canada here. Um, but provisioning services are the benefits from material or energy outputs derived from an ecosystem. So a material output would be a food or fiber or tobacco, or uh, some other primary material, or an energy output that you might get, say, uh, from, uh, from a tree, right, from burning a tree. So you're, these are, or they may, or another big one is water, right? So we've got kind of food, water, energy, that's a big set of things uh, that people, you know, we know that people need and they also get happiness from consuming those things. There's another set of services provided by ecosystems that directly benefit people. And these are called regulating services. So these, these are things which affect ecosystem processes that, that have a direct impact on people, right? So if we think about a, uh, let's think about two wetlands. One wetland is uh, right by a city. It, filters water, the runoff from city processes, and it provides a habitat uh, for, uh, let me think about this. So it uh, also provides a storm water uh, runoff kind of capture facility. So, and we, we go around Edmonton, you see these storm water uh, kind of ditches from here, from uh, around the city in different places. So that's a, that, that has a particular service, which is flood mitigation or stormwater uh, protection, right? So that's a, a service performed by that for a particular group of people. If you have that wetlands someplace in far rural Alberta, it may not have any corresponding group who directly benefit from it. So therefore that wetland in a sense provides less ecosystem services. So kind of the same, this demonstrates the same kind of environmental asset might have different values in different places. And that might uh, be really important for these regulating services. The third group of services that we think of that are kind of direct benefit to people are cultural services. So things like uh, spiritual values that might be that different religious groups or um, faith groups or cultural groups may associate with, uh, say, a, a grove of trees or uh, a mountain view. Um, there might be educational services that you get um, from an area or information or recreation, whether it be fishing or hunting or, uh, or um, riding your, your BMX bike through uh, an area. These are, these are all close, classified as cultural services. And then kind of underlying those three is the idea of supporting services. So these are as parts, things like uh, biodiversity, nutrient recycling, so the, uh, the nutrient cycle, uh, primary production of things like grass and soil formation. So these supporting services tend not to have kind of dollar signs that you can assign to them, where provisioning, regulating, cultural, 
and two, you can find kind of dollar signs associated with them, uh, kind of if you if you search hard enough. Um, so the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment did this review. This is from 2005, kind of their stock uh, of what was happening. Uh, and they looked at the world as of 1950s and the world as of the two year, about the year 2000, so Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Over that 50 year period or 40 to 50 year period, what had happened on the planet? Uh, are we getting more stuff from the planet in 2000 than we were in 2050. Uh, and for provisioning services, so these, and here they've defined it by nutrition, materials, and energy, and then some specific examples of each of those. Uh, mostly, we're getting more, we've been able to get more and more of these provisioning services from our ecosystems. So more, certainly more and more food, uh, more feed for animals, uh, more biofuels uh, we're getting, whether it's from ethanol or biodiesel. Um, and so we're, we're, we are at that, that type of ecosystem service, we're getting more. Yeah. What about the other categories? Not so good, right? Almost all of the regulating and maintenance services, so whether it's regulating wastes, um, so bioremediation would be like using a natural process to um, like um, deal with an organic compound um, or bioremediation happens when bulrushes grow in wetlands uh, and can kind of treat water to regulating flows uh, like having um, natural places in the landscape where water can accumulate like wetlands. So we're, we're not doing as good a job in that. So we go on through that and we see in that second category in green, only what one, only one going up of all these services, uh, everything else going down. So we have this big, at the biggest scale over these last 50 years, we're getting more provisioning services, we're losing regulating services. And what about uh, cultural services? That's also, those also are falling down in every case. So at this scale, then we see this big global scale, you know, in addition to this planetary boundary perspective, which is really about, about the whole, if you parse it out, but well, what about just us? What we're interested in as people, you know, who, who kind of cares about you know, the big picture? Let's, let, what, what's in it for me? Well, what's in it for me now is having a better balance uh, between provisioning services and the other services. We need to strike better balances so we don't just continually run this down. So certainly, if you took this, the weakest idea of, of sustainability as just producing the ability to produce more food, then you might say, yeah, this suggests maybe we're OK. But if you add anything else uh, about other things that we like, then we're, we're not meeting the weak sustainability criteria, right? Just even the things that we enjoy. Beyond, as soon as we go beyond the stuff that we consume, we look at the other things that we benefit from the ecosystems. We've got big trade-offs and we've got uh, overall negative declines on everything else other than the stuff that we consume. Just one more slide here. Uh, this is kind of a, how do all of these things link with agriculture according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment? So you can see many of things that I've discussed uh, in this set of lectures are listed here. Um, so I'm not gonna go over this, but I think we, you, you can think about, uh, um, think through what might be the link, say, with a dam for irrigation and water flow regulation, right? So if you're damming a river course, how does that how does that affect how does that create a negative effect in terms of uh, water flow regulation? Okay, so that that brings this set of mini lectures to a conclusion. Uh, so this will be the, the only set that I release this week. You know, stop sharing and stop.